Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. I'm delighted to say I'm here with somebody I have admired, admired from afar for many years, uh, David Avocado Wolf. Uh, David, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah. Now, there are many ways that I could sort of introduce you to our audience, but uh, one of the things I know you had a huge uh, year with is the Fruit Tree Planting Foundation, the nonprofit you're involved in. Yeah, just tell us about the big success story there. Well, as an entrepreneur way back when, you know, the people who trained me, my, my teachers taught me that, hey, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to have a nonprofit that gives back. And so I, for many years, I thought, okay, what do I want to give back to, right? What's my thing? And my thing is planting trees. So in 2002, I, plant, I founded the Fruit Tree Planting Foundation. And since that time, we planted a million trees in the world. But we had a big, big year in 2020. In spite of all the chaos, that's what I love about my team. They're that type of team that says, there's chaos, we're going to the middle of it. That's how they are. And we planted 96,000 trees in 2020. Wow, well, congratulations. Um, <laughs> I'm up to, my personal tally is, is four, a four, a plum tree, an apple tree, a fig tree and an apricot tree. In That's my pretty garden. good. That's better than nothing. Good <laughs> job. Better than nothing. And they are producing little, little ones. Which just, oh, and a pear tree. I missed our pear tree. Yes. Um, no, that's great. That's great news, David. Um, and I first met you. Uh, you were on stage uh, at an event that Kyle Viali in London put on in 2011. So a long way back. Wow. And uh, yeah, you... Uh, I suppose what you did for me was, I'll tell you a brief story and then we will get into you, but um, you really sort of validated the things that I had experienced. So I walked in to a, I didn't know at the time, a raw food restaurant in Santa Monica. This was a few years before this. And I didn't really know it was vegan. I didn't know it was raw food. And I was like, I don't know. Well, I didn't understand anything on the menu, but they did have a burger. So I'm like, oh, well, I understand a burger. I had this burger and it was like no burger I'd had before, right? It was like, seed bun and, and uh, you know, raw seed bun and then, and then this patty of a load of stuff I didn't really understand. And I ate this thing and it was absolutely de delicious. And I don't think I'd ever had a vegan meal before. And it was just, it was so sumptuous, right? And I, and I kept going back to this cafe and eating more and more of this, this raw food. And, and it was just extraordinary, like how much energy it gave me over time. I ended up like crapping like I'd never crapped before, <laughs> like all of this stuff coming out of me. But then I noticed like after a few weeks, because I was living in Santa Monica at the time, I stopped craving coffee. I was like, this is the first time in my life I've never wanted to craving. Like, what's going on? And, and so I, I sort of after this experience, I then started reading and getting more into your stuff and learning more about what was behind this experience I'd had. And then for the next you know, five or six years, I was really su super into raw food and veganism. And it gave me so much you know, energy uh, and vitality. I since have had two children who are now uh, three years old toddlers. And the lifestyle has just meant that keeping up the, the discipline that was required certainly of me and the commitments to keep that level of health going, I've not achieved, but I've now kind of got over the hump of the early years of my kids and I'm now getting back into it again. But I, you know, I just want to say by way of thank you for like really uh, helping me to deepen my understanding of what happened to me in those couple of weeks in Santa Monica. That's such a great story. And, and it, this is always what happens. We get derailed as soon as you have a family and it's like you're up at all hours and you need the stimulus. You need something to just get through it all. But good job. And that's really what happens is, is as you get into the raw foods and the cleansing, and especially as the, you, you eliminate more. I had a colonic yesterday and what a, what a difference. I was up till 4.35 in the morning and I got up at, I don't know, 8 this morning sharp. Um it, so the really what we're finding out is the more empty you are, the more energy you have. So that's probably what you're experiencing. You're getting this high vibration food coming in. You're more empty. And all of a sudden your body goes, hey, we don't need any more stimulants because we've got enough energy all of a sudden. It's really an energy equation. That's really what it's what, you know, people want more energy, but you're not going to get more energy in coffee. You're not going to get more energy by just the uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Right. And uh, at some point, at some point you have to empty. We call it pulling the, the plug out of the bathtub and drain all the old water out. And that's called the colonics and the enemas and the cleansing or the right diet or get on a vegan diet or low calorie diet or something in order to just get your body to eliminate better. And then your energy goes up and you start going, whoa, I got, I'm back to like 16 years old. What's going on here? It's great. And so that this is the, this is the power of diet. And then you can get on really what it's all about beyond all that is you have more energy to do what you love. I love planting trees. I love activism. 
Um, I, you know, I'm really excited with what's happening right now with the uh, all these uh, people on the internet battling the big hedge funds and you know basically power to the people i've been a power to the people type of person my whole life and i'm not i don't have any love of the establishment so it's been so fun just getting in there with the trenches with those people last couple days and just you know powering everybody up to battle the establishment because you have the energy to do it and that's where it's really that's where it's really at right yeah and that's something i know because i I followed you on telegram for a while and i was like this dude has got to be the most productive like it's just a social media machine and, and, I, and I that that sorry go on. I, I was just gonna say that like people follow me on telegram or one of my things like facebook or something i actually run nine social media sites all at the same time every day and they're all different and they're all different now that take took many years of training you know i've been doing i, I started social media i think with twitter in 2007 twitter is like terrible but it, it is really if i need to hunt down What's happening in a particular location real fast, I can get to it on Twitter in one minute. I can get to somebody's phone at some protest or something in one minute. It's just amazing. And so every one of these social media sites has their good and bad. And uh, But Telegram is personally my favorite. So I was glad that you you two did on that at least a little bit. Right, right. And and, and I'm aware, right, there are going to be some people in my audience who maybe just, you know, the thought of veganism or raw food or you know colonics it's just so far out there they're thinking like <laughs> if i you know if i managed like not to have you know if i have less than five beers in a night like it's a healthy day or something so i you know i'm sort of aware of that tension that maybe some people might feel it. so I'd, I'd like to sort of ultimately get back to like what can people do right if they're you know a long way from that lifestyle right now but before we get there i just you know i was re- reading your book uh, the beauty diet you know which has got a ton of great stuff in it and you mentioned there like your early days, like getting into this lifestyle and, and setting up as an entrepreneur. And you've mentioned foraging for your own food, which is fascinating. Could you just give us a little bit of the, the backstory to, you know, to David Wolf that is today? Well, what you, I'm, from, I'm from, from a family of medical doctors. Both my mom and dad are medical doctors. So I came from that background. That's why I, be, I was a black sheep in the family. I immediately rebelled against you know, that lifestyle of, you know, eat anything, anything goes here, we're going to inject you with all this stuff, we're going to you take these pills, you don't have to care about your diet or your health or your anything, just take this or eat that, and you'll be fine. And um, I never really bought any of that, because I saw it real close up early on. So I was think I think I was predisposed to be not only into medicine, but the right kind of medicine, natural medicine. And uh, eventually, when I was about 14 years old, you know, the like the kids that I grew up with, we were all kind of like a gang, you know, like a street gang. And we were, you know, you don't eat candy. You don't, you know, it started like that. It's like, we're still like that. I'm still in touch with those people almost every day, all those kids that I grew up with. And so we were really like kind of health oriented, you know, played a lot of sports and, and you know, kind of street tough in that way. Now, gradually that cascaded into, oh, let me look into veganism because I started having allergies to dairy products. And I started realizing, oh, it's dairy products that are doing this to me. I don't think dairy products are necessarily bad or bad for me, but the kind of dairy products that are on the market that are like, you know, you've got milk from a thousand cows, it's homogenized, it's all mixed together. That's not what we were having a hundred years ago. You know, we had a milk from one cow and it was fresh. So eventually I started realizing I'm really having allergies to processed foods. And that led me down the road of becoming a vegan, actually. And then eventually, I raw food and then really out, you know, I've been a vegetarian now for over 30 years. It's been wow. over 30 years. Now, occasionally I'll eat eggs or, you know, occasionally I eat things that aren't raw. Um, but for about 17 and a half years, I was actually 100% raw foods. Right, right. So that's a pretty unusual street gag. The kids who don't eat <laughs> candy and that's where you sourced your street cred. I'm just trying to. <laughs> so that was, you, that was you sort of formed an identity, like we're going against the system because we're not eating all of their food like how did it yeah how did that something identity like form? that i mean you know we, we were just it was just a particular social milieu of that particular environment i grew up in at that time you know i'm originally from the east coast of north america new york and new jersey when i was seven years old my uncle moved to san diego and then, it, and then we used to go visit him in california southern california that's where i started growing avocados by the way and that's where my name avocado comes from 1978 i planted my first avocado tree wow in California. But then it rolls around to 1980. My mom and dad are like, we got, we're going to move to California because it's just better living over there. And so we moved to California. And then the kids that lived on my street, you know, so many kids in that neighborhood 
we we just you know we were very athletic and you know we played football on the street every day and it was just a lot of fun you know but we were we had this because the social structure of southern california almost like a health salt surf culture we were like like if you if if like my friends saw you eating candy they'd rip it out of your mouth you know it was like that Right, that's extraordinary. Because when I think about, you know, that, that was like that was what you did to have fun. You'd go buy a load of pop and you know buy candies and yeah, like a smoke. Right, it was like to be unhealthy was the rebellious thing. Yeah. yeah, it was just you know it's part of the social structure, I guess, of that time and that position there in in Southern California. And I grew up really with Southern California surf culture, and that, which eventually kind of put me in a position where I was able to become kind of like the successor to, you know, some of the great health gurus that have come through Los Angeles, the Paul Braggs, the, um, who was the great one, my favorite, Jack Elaine, he was awesome. The, the uh, juice man, Jay Cordes, who became a friend of mine, his son worked for me for some period of time. And I was able to kind of step right in there and, you know, worked with my friend Truth Hawkins in Hollywood. And we were, you know, serving up celebrities every day at the tonic bar. You know, we had worked at this health food store called Air One and people would come in there and we'd just be firing out drinks. We called it slinging the jing, you know, we're just slinging drinks out all day and having so much fun. And that's really where, you know, I broke through. I think, you know, that's led to the new Triple and some other big projects. But ultimately, that's all just, you know, I, I've had great success in that kind of world and especially in, in uh, with television and that. But my, I'm a real, I'm a, again, I'm a like per people person. I'm more of a grassroots type of person. And so I never really was into oh like let's go get a mansion i you know i'd rather live in a cabin in the woods you know i just was never i don't know that's another part of my personality i just never thought like i don't need a yacht i don't need a mansion i don't want that stuff i just never liked it i was like let's get a let's go out in the middle of the forest and get a cabin and live with the animals right, <laughs> right. <laughs> and you were, it sounds like you were literally like for out there foraging for food when you're like starting up because yours is also a startup story right it's, it's an entrepreneurial story and you've got it no is. money and you're so you were, you you developed your um, wild food <laughs> interests through necessity. It sounds like through necessity. That's really true. That's the truth. Because there was times, you know, I think about 1995, 1996, 1994. Those times, there was too much month at the end of the money, and um, I would have to literally forage food out of the neighborhood. In fact, the, there was a crew that I used to go out with at that point that we would go hunt all the food in San Diego. There was you know whole areas, whole neighborhoods, North Park, San Diego, for example that was planted 80 years ago, or even at this point now, it's been a hundred years ago. And we would go out and get persimmons. We get olives, we get avocados, we get citrus fruit, we get all kinds of fruit that people didn't want even want. We'd knock on the door and say, hey, can we pick your lemons? They'd be like, yeah, take it all. And, and, and that's how we survived. That's how we survived back then. It was awesome. It was super awesome. And that's really where I, I you know, and that's what my teachers taught me way back then. You know, some certain people got on the phone who'd been into raw foods or veganism for decades, and they were like, "Oh no, it's all about the wild food." And I was like, "Oh, really? Okay." And then that got me into that. Right, right. So you're already out there foraging from gardens. You're like one step further. Let's uh, get out into the world, wild. Yes. Right. Brilliant. And okay, so we said so. That's like your your background, and and that helps me sort of situate you know where you are now. But like bringing it all the way back to some of the people in my audience, right? there and, and this is where I was right it just that kind of happenstance that I walked into this raw vegan you know I considered myself quite healthy right I had I ate stir fry fries I tried to like eat salad with my food and um but I, I you know there was a long period where I was drinking quite heavily and I didn't you know and I'd maybe smoke in the pub and you know I think there were just a, an awful lot of people with that lifestyle who you know perhaps don't realize what what it could be like what the alternative is and if I can't like create that experience where they could just go eat raw in Santa Monica for a month like what are the first few steps that are going to quickly give people an experience and a realization that I could feel differently one of the best things <clears throat> it really was effective for me is getting on drinking fresh cold pressed vegetable juice where you take right. a vegetable and you basically push it through a juicer and you drink that juice right there that will give you a lift real quick and you start going, geez, I got it. Something's going on here. Where it's, it's not a calorie thing. It's definitely not a protein thing. It's not a stimulant thing. It's not a sugar thing. There's something coming because suddenly you have, you know, you drank, I don't know, four or five sticks of celery, a cucumber, you threw a lemon in there and an apple. And you drink that and you're like, damn, man, I got some, this is something else. And, and that's really what I think got me hooked. It was the fresh right. vegetable juice. 
And then, well, you know, the, instead of having lunch, just like drink that. And it's like, yeah, I'm like hooked. And now back then, is again, I had too much month at the end of the money. So we used to go to the local health food store. We'd be like, hey, what you know, you guys are throwing away produce. Just put it all in a trash bag for us. We'll swing by at 7 p.m. in the evening. You reach your arm out of the back door. We'll swing by. We'll grab it. We'll take that. We'll go back home and juice it. And we did that. And, and that was amazing. In fact, a friend of mine who I used to do that with, his name was Caleb. We ended up nicknaming him Kale. He was a he was a heroin addict. He was a heroin addict, and he survived that. And he was like, "I got to get my health together." And that's how we, that's what we did is we drank vegetable juice together. We we would have these big. I mean, this was almost you know close to a gallon, like almost four liters of vegetable juice that we drink in the evening because we get all the stuff free from the health food store that they were going to throw away. What a change that'll do for you. That'll that'll do something for you that'll wake you up. Right, right. So get on those, get on those juices. And, you know, I like the fact you put an apple in there because I know one of your messages is something I've taken away from your teaching is that, you know, not everything has to be delicious, right? Not everything has to be yummy, right? To be good for you, which I think, you know, it's kind of obvious, but it's an important message. And I think they're like to start with, you know, just throw a, a few apples in, right? You know, to take the edge off to begin with. Yeah, right. Take the edge off. That's well said. It doesn't have to be like the most sweet thing there is, but a lemon and an apple in with all those vegetables, it takes the edge off and it actually makes it good. And you're like, I, I could drink this, but it's, you're really going for the effect. I mean, you know, a lot of like, a lot of people like the taste of beer, but they like the taste, they, they like the feeling of the buzz more. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. And exactly. it's kind of, it's like that, but it's upgraded. In fact, you're getting a different, whole different kind of buzz. It's a buzz that keeps on giving. There's no hangover the next day. You're you're more charged than ever before. All of a sudden, your bowels are emptying out because you get this vegetable juice coming in. Your body goes, let's get rid of all this. And it's just a beautiful, it's a beautiful way of life. It really is. And it leads to other things. It leads to you into going, maybe I should garden. Maybe, you know, what's, how would it be to grow this stuff myself? And just, there's other things that come with it. Right, right. And and you said they're cold pressed, which is an important point, right? There's a difference between most of the juices we get in stores. They're not cold press they take people through that well they're either made from concentrate or they're not cold pressed or they're they're flash pasteurized which means they're pasteurized so they're cooked and uh, and therefore they've lost that that life force factor there's just really nothing that can compare to like fresh celery cucumber apple lemon or fresh parsley carrot beet or you know just these things where you just kind of throw them all together and you drink it and you're like what is this you can't you can't bottle that it's you know, I've had different scientists over the years who wrote books and did voluminous research in this area. They, like my friend Dr. Patrick Flanagan, no longer here, but he he had this whole thing about zeta potential that the actual surface tension on the juice is that at a maximum when it's fresh, and then it just diminishes very quickly within a few hours um, once that's been sitting around. And then when you flash pasteurize it, you destroy the colloidal matrix. It's the thing that suspends all of the goodies in the fluid you know how stuff drops out right. if it's yep. sitting there that that is the zeta potential it loses zeta potential and that's that, you know that's, that's the surface one tension theory. dissipates you don't it you dissipates don't have them held right yeah yeah and then so that you lose something from that because the colloidal matrix when you drink it it's still in its colloidal form your body goes oh we know what this is and just takes it right in and it's fresh and it, you know it's it's got the magic but once it's been sitting even for a few hours your body goes ah eh, you know i don't know it's still better than than diet Pepsi. It's still better <laughs> better than than cola or something. But it's not the same. And that something there, maybe it's life force energy is probably the best way to describe it. You know, again, this data potential is used. Other scientists have said it's the enzyme factor. Other scientists have said other things. But it's really the life force. You know, there's something about fresh living food that produces healthy fresh living cells. Right. Yeah. And that was, you know, that was something I suppose that, yeah, that you're alluding to there, what I started to sense when I started having a taste of this. Yeah, you you just feel a little bit more buzzy, a little bit more bouncy. Uh, you know, I did, the other thing that you, I stopped getting completely was the three o'clock dip, right? It just, it just went. And and uh, for a lot of people listening, that just, you just assume that's part of life, right? It's like, oh yeah, you know, we get a bit tired, you know, middle afternoon, but that, that went, it's like, that doesn't have to be normal. Yeah, that's an important point. It- we're living actually oftentimes under, you know, energy levels and health levels that are way, way below what our actual birthright is. We're, we are designed to be incredibly energetic. We're designed to go until we drop. I typically will get up at eight or nine in the morning and go till three, four, five in the morning every day, nonstop. It just, and it doesn't matter if it's Saturday or Sunday or Monday or whatever day it is. 
And that's how it's supposed to be. And if I'm really on it, like if I'm doing a long cleanse or water fast or something like that, it can get crazy because the main problem for me with fasting is that I actually have too much energy. I have so much energy. I don't know what to do with myself because th this is that equation. Like, hey, if you get the waste out, like I did yesterday with the colonics, I got the waste out. You act your energy eventually, you know, your body will catch up and do the things it needs to heal itself. But eventually your body catches up and you get ahead and your body goes, oh, we got energy. We're going to keep going. Because if you think about it, like in the hunter gatherer stage, we didn't like you. If it was feast and famine, if you didn't have food, you were fasting. And you had to be sharper. You had to have more energy. This is the human. This is the human condition. This is how we're how it's supposed to be. Most people today, they don't eat. They're like, oh, well, I can't move because they're detoxifying. Right. Because generally, the modern humans overeating. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting, and I've actually started fasting, so that's something that I have been able to incorporate more easily, right? Oh, good. Yeah, like reducing the the range of food that I intake has been harder than actually just stopping eating. We could all do that, right? We just don't eat, and uh, yeah, so I've got into a rhythm of fasting every day now. I don't have, um, you know, I don't. I, I I saw an interview with you with your cousin, uh, and he was mentioning you you don't need a meal, right? You don't necessarily need you a meal when we get to like thirty years old. You know, we get it out of that, that growth into adulthood that we don't need a we don't need a, a a meal necessarily in the in the morning we can go and i found that that to be true that's so important i'm so glad you're bringing that up because people say well what do i do first first thing you do when you get up in the morning is drink about a liter of water drink a liter of water first before coffee tea before anything just drink a liter of water and let that move through you and push everything out and then just try to skate as long as you can without having anything like i'll have like you know some kind of a um blended smoothie in the morning if I eat anything at all, that, and that usually comes like today, that didn't come until 11. Right. right. So I, I'm not getting up and like eating something right away. It'll be hours before that. And usually, of course, it starts with water. And then maybe you get to like lunchtime or maybe it's dinner time before you really have a meal. And at our age, I mean, I'm 50. I've got to, I can't be like eating three meals a day. That's crazy. You know, that's not a hunter gatherer lifestyle, by the way. You, you eat like really one big meal a day. It's kind of like the Roman army. You know, the Roman army would just march and forage and march and forage and march and forage. And then in the evening, they'd have one big meal. And then the next day, it was march and forage, march and forage. That's kind of a real, that's more natural for a human being, for sure. You'll be healthier. Right, right. And it's interesting, you know, from your perspective, it's crazy to think that you have to have three meals a day. And yet that is the norm for the vast majority of the population, right? Yes. And then, well, that's what's that going to cause? It's going to cause obesity. It's going to cause you to be slowing down. It's going to cause you to be energy um, ups and downs. It's going to lead to problems because overeating problems leads to diabetes. Overeating problems leads to all heart disease. Overeating problems leads to arthritis. You sure too much. It's an overload where your body goes, look, we can't even like stop for a second and just give me a rest. And when you're 20 years old, you, this is not a problem. You don't even think about this. You can eat three meals a day. It's not a big deal. But when you're 50, you, your body starts going, hey, slow down. But when you're like 60 or 70, you can't get away with it. You just can't. Right, right. Yep. Now, let's talk a little bit about immunity. I mean, without going down the rabbit hole of, you know, <laughs> the all of current circumstance stuff. and all of that <laughs> stuff. Something I picked up in your book, again, the, the beauty diet is, 70% uh, of our immune system is in the digestive system, right? I thought that was a fascinating fact, right? That, yeah, that what we do in terms of how we digest our food and what exists in our digestion, that's the core of our immune system. So if that's true, like what, what are the things we should be doing to build our immune system, to have the best shot of, of this current virus or anything else that's coming along? Okay, so one of the things I'm going to preface it with is that the systems that we are in are not, they're not capable of solving the problems. You know, these are old antiquated systems or antiquated theories of medicine, they're antiquated theories entirely. So this is how things move forward. A new technology or new innovations come that just completely replace it all. So that's, I'm going to be speaking from that perspective. Number one is, is almost always you don't catch a cold, you eat a cold. You ate something, it didn't feel right, you had bubbles and gurgles and this thing, next thing you know, you got flu symptoms, next thing you know, you got a cold or a flu or whatever, you know, coronavirus or whatever it is. So what ends up happening is, is that you have to really monitor what you're eating. So if something is upsetting your stomach, there's a very important antidote that can stop any of this from developing. And that is activated charcoal. 
Activated charcoal is a tremendous and simple neutralizer of digestive, like food poisoning, digestive um, um, poisoning. And suddenly you neutralize it, maybe 500 milligrams, 1,000 milligrams. If it's really bad, maybe you do 2,500 milligrams or 3,000 milligrams. And you, you just take that with water and very quickly will neutralize the stomach bug. So that's number one. Number two is, is that eventually you realize that it's by the tissue cleansing and the bowel cleansing. So you get everything out that you're, you actually don't have material for the critters to feed on, right? You know, what's a virus? It's really a parasite. What's a harmful bacteria like staph? It's really a parasite. What's a tapeworm? Definitely a parasite. What's a liver fluke? It's definitely a parasite. Ultimately, illness is caused by like organisms, like a virus that goes, Hey, um, we're going to eat the extra that's over there. There's extra waste and that's food for us. And so when you get that waste out, you're stepping your whole system up another level. Then eventually you get to where I'm at with it, which is eventually you get to the herbalism, really. So the herbalism has been keeping us healthy for thousands of years and has preceded everything. And we survived all the plagues and everything else to this moment. So we did know something in the past that was good. It's a lost knowledge and we're bringing it back, which is the herbalism. Now, not all herbs are the same. I love echinacea and I take echinacea when I need it, but I don't take echinacea every day. What the discovery of the Taoists is and, and really of the great yogis, and it's really every herbal system eventually figured this out, is you want to be actually taking, this is the phrase, right? Food is your medicine. But the, the complete phrase is, have food is your medicine and medicine is your food. That's the complete phrase. So we often hear the first part, food is medicine. It's like, okay, we got that. That makes sense. But we never talk about the second part, which is medicine is food. What does that mean? It means the herbalism as food. So certain herbs are actually, you can take them every day as a food. And one of the great categories of that, that's super immunological. And one of my favorite things of all time are the medicinal mushrooms which are mm -hmm. mushrooms that grow from trees. And the medicinal mushrooms are non-toxic. They're great allies of humanity and they modulate and totally transform your immunity. And when you take a bunch of different ones together, like reishi mushroom and chaga mushroom and lion's mane and fomis fomentarius and tremula and mesema and um, um, well, latiporus sulfurius and um, auricularia and just goes on just like 25 of the big ones. If you take, let's say five of those or two of those, or one of those, or 10 of those regularly over time, your immune system, you, you actually start to feed those herbs or food for your immune system. Like celery is a good food for your intestines. Celery is a great food for your bones. Um, lettuce is a great food for your lungs. Um, apples are great food for your digestive system and great for your cardiovascular system. But there's food that's specific for your immune system. And those are the what we call the tonic herbs or super herbs, herbs you can take every day. Like astragalus is one of those. You could take astragalus every single day. You could take reishi mushroom every single I was day. Gonna say, I, I brought some of my supplements here because uh, this will come out. There's my astragalus that I'm taking. See, there you it know, is. Based off your, uh, your recommendations. And, and, uh, and I've also got a, a, a mushroom complex with six, I think. I don't have that coming up. But I got the chaga. The Winning. cordyceps, the shiitake, the rishi, the lion's mane, the maitake. Right. See that? See that? This is the effect that I've had on the market over the years. Is we, you know, what you have right there in your hand is a product and an innovation that we developed in Los Angeles many years ago. Because in, when I was working in that in the tonic bar there at Air One in, in Hollywood, we were opening capsules because that's the only way you could really get the rishi and the maitake and the shaga, you know, if you wanted to get it as a powder. And eventually we're like, why don't we just call these people up who are, who are growing the, these, you know, in, in Labrador, the laboratory conditions or growing them in control conditions and get them as a powder in bulk. Right. And then mix them together. So you'd have, you know, just this, let's say lion's mane mushroom or just reishi or just shago or just um, oyster mushrooms or whatever. And then eventually led to that product you have in your hand right there. Right. Right. Which yeah. is making it easier for people. Yeah. No, no, it's, uh, it's, it, it it's great. And I suppose what's, to some extent, I, you know, one has to take this on faith, right? Like I don't have the time in my day to go read all the papers and do all the research that you got. So I have to just take this stuff somewhat on faith uh, and, 
and kind of I think one of the mindset shifts is you kind of become an experimenter on yourself, right? And and this like, and that's a bit of a shift that I had to go through. Like, you're not there's no authority that can tell you like, okay, it's definitely these type of mushrooms, or it's definitely this like combination of uh, of of uh, supplements that you need to take. But you just try stuff, you incorporate stuff. Do I feel better? Am I getting like colds a lot less often? I can't remember the last time I had a cold, for example. Well, well, yes, okay. Well, I'm I'm just gonna keep keep taking these and 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 look at people around me who who seem like they're full of energy and full of life and and look healthy and listen to what they're saying. It's like a different way of like navigating health, isn't it? Because you're not you're not relying on authority so much. That's something I've noticed. Shifting. Yes, for sure. I mean, that one of the great teachings I got when I was younger is success leaves clues, and so you've got to look for people. Okay. Over the years, people started going like even my detractors over the years eventually come around and they're like, what are you doing? dude? You're like 50 years old. You're running around. I mean, like you said earlier, like you, you've seen my Telegram feed. That's just one of nine feeds that I'm doing as a side job to my normal day. It's just a side thing, right? Like nobody normally can do that unless something's going on that's unusual. You know what I'm saying? So eventually people start to go, what is going on here? Like you, you can't be doing this all yourself. And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm doing it all by myself. And they're like, every day? And I'm like, yep, every single day, all day long. It's like, yep, all day long. And eventually people start to go, well, I want what he's having. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's like, that's, a, that's the inevitable next step. And so again, what we do, the way I take people from that step, as soon as they're ready to, to really jump on, I'll say, okay. Do a cleanse with us. Like the, our next cleanse that we're going to do, it's an online cleanse we do with a thousand people all over the world. But this time might be 2,000. It's growing all the time. Is we guide you through a three week cleansing process. We all do it together. We all get in a chat group together. And then we just go step one, day one. And we just don't jump to day five. We're, just, we're on day one. All of us stay on day one. And then the next day comes and we stay on day two. And I do the cleanse too with everybody. Because, you know, it's really fun for me and I love getting down to eventually we work our way down to juices and eventually if you want to, to a water fast. I always do a week long water fast to end it all. And um, because that's when I'm most productive for sure is when I'm doing a water fast. And then we just got we just take you through that process. And if you if you just do the process, I've worked this out over 27 years. You can imagine how what I've been through and how many different ways I've tried to mix this up. It's just a three week system. You do it twice a year and you'll be happier for it. Now, this in 2020, because it was such a crazy year, we did three of them in 2020 because it's the more chaos that happens outside, the more you work inside and the better. That's really a great direction of focus. The more chaos out there, the more we work inside here. Right. Right. And, and of course, at the moment, the buzz is like, how do I stay resilient? How do I keep my energy levels up? I'm stuck in my house. I, I never get out. I'm not seeing my friends. I've got no social life. Sounds like something like this where you're you're going within uh, could be really powerful people for people right now. It really can, and not only that, you're meeting friends online because everyone's going through it together. One of our phrases that we love, and it's something I've learned over the years, is "together is always better." Right, together is better, and so doing this by yourself is very difficult. I did that for years, like cleansing and detoxing and all the whole thing, you know, by myself and just toughing it out with no support. It's, a, it's really tough. But, you know, because it, this is what I do for, you know, my profession, I was like, okay, I'll just tough it out, I'll get through it. And it's not easy for just normal everyday people are just like, look, I just want to do a cleanse. When you have everyone doing it, then you have a support community and you're, you're, you're it's to your phone. It's to your phone. So they're, you're supported. You're like, I'm going through it right now. I'm on the floor of the bathroom. I'm going through it right now. We're like, no, hang in there. We're with you. You know, there's other another 10 people who are in that same exact position in some other part of the world. This person's in New Zealand, that person's in Australia, this person's in Canada, this other person's in New York City. It's super fun. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's I, really cool. I, it reminds me. So Tanya Meyer, who who's uh who who opened the first raw food restaurant in the UK in London, uh, who's a big fan of yours. I did one of her re retreats in uh in Vilcabamba in uh, Ecuador. Yeah, and it's the same thing. We're all in together. It's like, no, don't go get that pizza. Like, hang in there. Like, keep going, right? It makes such a difference. It makes such a difference. And it, you don't have to do this for the rest of your life, but you do need to do cleanses periodically to give your body a break. And, th and that's self-evident. We call them, you know, detox deniers. When someone's like, oh, it doesn't work. Come on. It's like, no problem. You're a detox denier. Come right in. Just go through the process with us and you'll find out. And eventually, usually around day four or day five, they're like, 
oh my God, this does, you know, they, they go from like a Holocaust denier. They, we call them detox deniers. It just, by the experience of what happens, they go, oh, okay, I get it. And that's how we're converting people on mass. actually. It's like, oh, you're a denier? No problem. We just go through the process with us anyway. Just fake it. Pretend like it's, you know, you just go through it. And usually, again, day four or five, then they're like, whoa, this is amazing. But then, you know, we're taking them through 21 days. So it's so cool to see that evolution and where people are on day 15 and where they are on day 18. It's awesome. And that's why I keep doing it. I'm going to keep doing it. Right. And, and so, and, and remind me, so the next one is? March 11th. March 11th, right. And we'll make we'll sure we put all the links, day one. You know, links uh, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the chat. Um, yeah, no, that, I, and, and that's, I guess, it, where I started with my story, right? This is experiential. You, you, you're never going to work this out. You're never going to feel motivated to do it by just like reading stuff. You, it, it, find a way to experience it and then ask yourself, do I feel different? Right. And if it's, you do, do more of it, right? If then you, you do more. Do more that's it. it. And, and, and you, you get out of, you know, people go into their mind and be like, well, what? Then I'm not going to be able to have my, you know, pint at the pub. Then I'm not going to, all this stuff, this gobbledygook comes in. Just put all that down. Don't worry about any of that. Just day one. Then we're going to do day two. And then we do day three. And so we just keep people in the moment because you know how the projections, everyone goes into their mind. They're yeah. like, well, what about this? Then what about that? Well, what about day 28? It's like, <laughs> we're on day three. What you, we're not on day 28. Just hang in there. Yeah, yeah, no, that's so true. And something else, a phrase I took from you, which which I lent on multiple times, but I, uh, when I was really like pushing to stay a hundred percent raw in the early days, was um, um, ease and grace. Right, you moved in a direction with ease and grace, and I like that. Like, I just kept falling onto that when you know my head was saying, "Oh, you're not doing this, and you're not eating that, and you're not, you know," and you you set this sort of expectation in your mind. Just let that go. Like, just move in a direction with ease and grace. I thought that was just a wonderful message. Well said. We're always trying to cultivate ease and grace. And again, it's, you know, it's always this mind stuff. This mind chatter comes in. It's just, it's really what it is. It's a projection. It's pushing something into the future. It's not, it doesn't have to do with the moment. It's some kind of projection. Well, what about, what about, their, what am I, what are they going to think of me? Or what's going to happen when I get to work on Monday? Or you just, we'll deal with that on Monday morning. Don't worry about it. Right now it's Saturday afternoon. We're we're in a, we're on a hike in nature. Let that go, you know. So, but this is part of the human condition, right? The part of the human condition is that we're projecting all the time. We're, you know, worried about things that don't aren't ever going to happen. And so, I found that a lot. I mean, pretty much all of it's psychological. I mean, when it comes to all of this stuff, health and energy and everything, it really is your state of mind. It's your attitude that begins it all. And it's your attitude that is fortified as you get going because you have to just fake it. Like, okay, I'm just going to have an attitude of gratitude. I just fake like I'm in gratitude. But eventually, when the energy comes, it's easier. You're easier. It's easier to hold that attitude, an attitude of grace, an attitude of ease, an attitude of gratitude, an attitude of appreciation. Right, and all these things play off each other, right? Because you have you're feeling less lethargic. You're feeling kind of more in a more buoyant view, mood, and so yeah, exactly. The, yes, the, 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 the food we are what we eat and we sort of almost like we think what we eat, right? Like somehow our thought processes are related to you know, what's inside. Well, it is. That's an interesting thought. Like our dominant thoughts, this is something I've been really, really working on for many years. And some of the great artists in the world, musicians, and um, you know, I'm thinking, you know, I'm wearing Alex Gray's shirt right now. You know, Alex Gray is one of my best friends and he's also, you know, he's given me great feedback over the years. He said, one of the things that you've really brought to me, you know, with the superfoods and the super herbs, you know, out this is Alex Gray telling me this, is you've re- kind of re-inspired my creativity. And that was actually one of the goals that I had set down way back in the very, very beginning, 27 years ago, was to become that for the people who were the great artists of the world, the great musicians of the world, to wow. re-inspire and reinvigorate them later in their careers so that they could they could have a resurgence. And Alex has said that to me, and other musicians have said that to me over the years too. You know that that you know, there's something about getting suddenly recharged where you're like you think it's over for you. You know you're 58 or something, and you think, oh, you know it's all downhill from here. And all of a sudden you do a cleanse, or you all of a sudden you clean your bowels out, start drinking fresh juices, and you're like, wait a second, it ain't over, it's on again, and your thoughts change. Right? Yeah, your thoughts change. And that's, and I remember this is a documentary about um, some yak herders in. I think it's Mongolia, right? And uh, I'm sure they weren't raw foodists, but they had very, um, you know, extremely healthy diet, organic diet, you know, they're living off the land. 
and it, it was common for guys in their 70s you know to to be fathers right and they were still you know it was just in that that kind of culture yeah there's you just it's a completely different expectation of your life path i think yeah for sure i'm more familiar with what's going on in peru because i've spent the better part of 15 years in peru and over there i have a, like i had a friend who gave birth at 51 she gave birth at 51 so that's common actually you see that all the time. You'll see women in their 50s, native people of Peru, they give birth in their 50s who are super healthy and just, you know, have very, very big families and have been giving birth for over 20, 30 years even. So they've had, you know, I don't know, 15 kids over 30 years. It's really impressive. And there, in my opinion, the native people of Peru, the Quechua people are the healthiest people in the world. They They live on and on and on and on. I mean, You'll see them in their 60s and they're marching up and down mountains, no problem, like they were 20. You know, it's incredible. So that's, that is, that has become, we always bring them with us, actually. We always take a few of those Quechua shamans with us on our tours and stuff. We always get two or three of them, like, okay, Juan, like Juan and Luis are two of my favorites. And they're always just right there. And they're psychic too. Like, I, we could be at Machu Picchu and we're leading a group of 30 people. And I can look at Juan across Machu Picchu and he sees me and he knows what I'm thinking. And he knows what the next step is going to be. And I don't have to say anything to him. It's just incredible. And uh, and I'm sure it's true also with the people of the Himalayas, you know, the Tibetan people and stuff like that. But I'm just more familiar with the Peruvians. Right, right. Yeah. No, the, this, and I, again, it, this comes back to experiential. You could talk to people about this and it all sounds, you know, very woo-woo. And just go experience this. Like, try some of this stuff and test it for yourself like and I, and I remember that's what Gandhi used to you know I don't know Gandhi was like one of the first vegetarians right that we recognize you know at least I suppose in in in, in modern history uh, he founded the vegetarian society in London and he had this idea that I experiment on myself right I try different things I see what what impact it has I, I take me out for three months and I see what happens. I, that as an just a sort of strategy or an approach to health uh feels like really important it's really important. You know, when I think of when I come to the UK, for example, I think of the British people, I think of like all the adventures of the British people and all these places around the world. And, you know, they're very, it's a very adventurous race of people. And what we're doing here is we're really just taking that adventurous spirit. We're turning it inward. We're saying, how about, you know, you want to smoke DMT? No problem. But why, check, why don't you, why don't you clean your bowels out and watch out what experience that is? Um, you want to go fly over to Bali? No problem. But why don't you do this cleanse with us? you know, for three weeks and watch what happens to your life. And it's an adventure. And if you look at it, and interpret it as an adventure, then it's a totally different thing. And it really, what it is, it's an experiment you're doing on your body. And as, as Gandhi said, there is that, you know, that wonderful feeling of like having to experience and know, wow, this is what the effect is of being a vegetarian. This is what the effect is of eating raw food. Here's what the effect is of only doing liquid diet. And, and that's truly what it's about. Right. And that that helps me make the link to you and the kid in the gang, you know, not eating candy. You are adventurous in a sense, right? Right. You're not adventurous in the way that, you know, I think of like we take our BMX bikes and, you know, try and um, maybe you're doing that as well. And, you know, ride down the, the biggest hill or we'd go take rafts and ride down rivers and so on. You, you were adventurous, right? You're just in the realm of health and food. And that that was yes. your adventure. For sure. But, you know, as a kid, I was very adventurous, you know, racing like motorbikes. You know, yeah. I thought about one time where I took this jump. When I landed, my, my hand slipped off the handlebar. My face came like really close to hitting the handlebars. And I was like, whoa, I came within an inch of knocking my teeth out. And so I was like, I think I'm going to do some different types of adventures or different types of stuff, you know, instead of that. Because, you know, when that happens to you and you have that kind of a close call, it's like, hey, that adventure is now done. Now let's adventure in another way. And, and this is really a great one, the adventure of diet, exploring levels of energy that are really possible for you. Adventures of fasting. When I do a fast, like a week-long water fast at the end of a cleanse, and people are welcome to join that if they want. If they want to stay on the juices or liquids, they can do that. We're all still doing it together. It's just, to me, I go, okay, I'm now I'm on a 7 or 8 or 9 or 10 or 11 or 12-day adventure of not eating. And let's see what happens. Let's see where this ends up. Like the last one. I ended up doing, on the final day, I ended up doing dips in a river um, in the ice, breaking the ice and getting into a river in uh, Calgary, Alberta, in Canada. That's where I ended up ending that cleanse. And that's how it came to a halt for me. It was like, okay, on the final day, I'm going to do something crazy. Okay, I'm going in that river. It was, you know, that kind of stuff. Brilliant, brilliant. 
And what you're pointing to here is like doing it together with others. Um, and I don't know if you're aware of this study, uh, and I think I'm getting the details right, but it's some, they did this study in New York and they had these two groups of American Italians uh, and one was living significantly longer than the other and they couldn't understand it, right? They're, they're living you know, in the same city, they've got the same Mediterranean diet and this one group was living longer. And what they noticed with the, the group that was living longer was they had much richer social connections. They were spending much more time in each other's company. They had a much you know, stronger community and, and, and uh, you know, their social life was, was much richer. And they lived longer. Like that, that seems to be an important factor here. Very important. That's actually was in Pennsylvania. Oh, was it Pennsylvania? Not it New was York. Pennsylvania. Okay. And it's basically a group of Italians had gotten on a boat, you know, I don't know, it was 100 years ago. And they're like, hey, you're 120 years ago, maybe, or even longer, 140 years ago. And they got on a boat and they yeah, they came over from Italy and they landed in, in America and they ended up in this community in Pennsylvania with other communities of Italians. But they were particularly socially connected from because they all came from one village in Italy. And they they just outlived everybody around them. And eventually people got onto this and like, why is it something in the water? Is it they're eating different? What is it? And they found out it was just the social cohesion of the community. And so this tells us that thing that I was saying before, which is together is better. If they needed to fix the road, they'd all get together and fix the road. If they needed to add another room to the house because there was another child in the family, they'd all get together and build another room together. This is really an important thing for all health in general. It's one of the reasons why our society is so unhealthy is that these core communities have been uprooted, changed. There's people living next door that we don't even know who they are. There's people living above us, below us, we don't know who they are. And hopefully with the, the whole pandemic situation, that hopefully that's changed for all of us, that we've actually gone. I know it changed for me. I went and met all my neighbors, you know, people I've lived next to for uh, you know, 16 years that I didn't know really well. I mean, I've seen them around, but now I'm going over their house. Now we're hanging out. Now we're having, you know, fun together. And and that's where we need to go in the future to have a healthy future is to get to know your neighbors, get to know the people around you, get together as a community, have some fun together. Right, right. And, and you know, that's something that I, is a big motivator for me because I don't have that in my life. Like sometimes we'll have a meal as a family, but I don't have like a, you know, a really rich social life in that way where I'm really connected to my community and we're coming together for meals and social. Like, so, so there's a part of me that thinks I can focus as much as I like on the mushrooms and the charcoal. And, but that's an important part for me to build, you know, in terms of my longer term health. It is. It really is. I mean, it's, you know, it all fits in together. And uh, one of the things I love about the, you know, the food and the diet is it's how you're feeling moment to moment. So, you know, people are saying, well, what, you know, or how do you know you're going to live to be 80 or 90? It's like, well, I don't even really care because we're just in today. There's no tomorrow. Tomorrow's never going to arrive. Yesterday's gone forever. We're right in this eternal moment. And so it's how you're feeling right now. That's right. what's important. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. That's, that's important. Um, but it also links to this, this idea of being community links to another study uh, where they put tags on people in a, in a, in a workplace There's a, an, and monitor their social interactions. And they found, uh, they watched them at lunchtime and they found that I think the magic number was 11. When you had 11 people sitting down for lunch, you got this creativity spike that didn't exist with a smaller number. And it, this was so important. Uh, for, and how many workplaces now have a canteen where like 11 people regularly will lunch together? I mean, that's kind of unheard of. And yeah. yet they found in the research that this was so important for creativity. And what do all businesses want right now? It's like creative workers. That, well, see, this is the thing about, you know, this, the idea of like social distancing and all this other stuff is, first of all, you're dealing with viral particles that will go right through a mask. They'll go right through everything. It's, you can't actually, the you know, I'm speaking as a health professional. I am a, a, a nutritionist. I have a master's degree in nutrition. By the way, I have a master's degree in nutrition. I have a Juris Doctor in Law, two engineering degrees, and a um, doctorate in philosophy, which is really political science. But, you know, that's my help, my education background. And my research on viruses, which is extensive. I worked with Dr. Hitt in Tijuana for 10 years. Dr. Hitt was the greatest student of Dr. Papilloma, the guy who developed the pap smear. And so what Dr. Hitt taught me was, you know, you can't, there's nothing we can actually do to stop it except prepare ourselves and improve our own health. The vitamin D3, get the medicinal mushrooms and make sure we've got things like quercetin, zinc. Um, make sure you have these, you know, very powerful and important um, adjuncts like hydroxychloroquine and or ivermectin if you need them and 
just, you know, if, if you're doing the things that I recommend, you don't actually need that stuff. But for newbies, you might need that because it's, it's so overwhelmingly powerful. And if you do all that, you're not, you're going to be able to prevent yourself from, from su succumbing because you're improving your own terrestrial environment rather than, you know, depending on, you know, the, the whole community to protect you, right? That's, that doesn't work. It's never worked. So the whole thing has actually become insanely political. The people in, at, with power have realized, oh, we can just exploit this for power. And, uh, and it doesn't actually work. The only thing we can do is defend ourselves. We could actually quarantine people who are very susceptible. And that's what historically humans have always done. You know, if there was a plague coming through, you always quarantine the people who are most susceptible. Get them out of the public and get them tucked away for a year or two um, and, you know, get their social interactions down. But generally, to diminish social interactions amongst human beings is not good for health. And yeah, so the, that, yeah, that's a general. We're getting we're getting a, a cure that's point. worse than the cause is what I'm driving at. Right. Well, there was there was the Barrington Declaration. I don't know if you're familiar with that, which which basically made, made that point. You know, what we want to do is we want to protect the most vulnerable. Uh, yeah, and that should be our priority, right? Yeah, right. And that's but it, things today. It's just insanely political. There's exploitation of fear, and uh, you can you can you know I've had many friends who who got coronavirus or whatever's going around. And I think there's a few things going around and it was right. And I definitely think it hit for sure. It hit the West coast of North America. It by February, there was people in my immediate community because I was traveling from Vancouver over to Alberta. So I was traveling through the Kootenays and there was definitely people in my immediate area that had respiratory problems for a long time, for weeks on. And I was like, well, okay, something's going around, very, something very intense. I know it hit Los Angeles by December. Now, new data has told us that, that I'm probably right about this, that it actually hit North America earlier than we've been told and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, we all survived it. I never got sick from it. I, you know, it's ultimately, if you're really strong immunologically, you're, you won't get sick. Or if, you, if you're reasonably strong immunologically, you'll overcome it quickly. That's what the data shows. And so there's not, this is nothing to be freaking out about, actually, now okay. that we know. Right. Yeah. Well, for those of us with strong immune systems, that seems to be true, doesn't it? That, yes. That there's nothing to, to, to get to, too concerned about. Um, yeah. And I have to say, like, yeah, I mean, the mask stuff, there's a debate. You know, I saw, there was, there certainly saw one study that was suggesting it. You know, there was, um, there was little evidence that it, it protected you. But maybe it, you know, but they, they could, they won't, it wasn't conclusive on whether or not it impacted other people. Um, it certainly seems to be, um, th there's a mix, seems to be mixed data on it, right? Yeah, there's mixed data. That, that's, that's, that's important to understand. So it's not conclusive. So we've got to you know, take a position. If we want to take a scientific position, then we need to, do, let's get 30 studies going, right? Because this is a big issue. It's affecting billions of people at this point. Let's put 30 studies together and let's, let's get some answers. And let's look at it scientifically, but it's become so insanely political, as we know, right. that all of a sudden there's like, well, we actually don't need a study because we want you to do what we say. You better obey. It's become more about obeying and, and that kind of stuff. But for all of us, we don't need to get caught up in all that. Ultimately, what we got to do is protect ourselves and we can immediately protect our family. And the way to do that is the things we've been discussing on this call. Eat less, have more bowel movements. Get some of these great things in like the astragalus that you had there and, and get the wonderful medicinal mushrooms and start learning about that. Get that in. Get more smoothies going in your diet. So blend things up more. Um, make sure that whenever you have a chance, do a cleanse. You know, go with the cycles of nature. Like the big one that we're doing March 11th is because that's springtime. That's when your body's going, hey, winter's over. We're going for spring cleansing. So the winter actually ends. Let's see. It's going to happen. It happens in the northern hemisphere, usually around, it depends on your latitude. That's the day of equal day and night is the last day of winter. And that usually rolls around. Like, let's say you're in northern, you know, part of the UK, in Scotland somewhere. It's probably going to be March 17th. Would be, right. you know, maybe March 18th, something like that. And, um, you know, let's say you're further south. It'll come a little bit earlier. It might be March 15th. And that's why we're doing, we're starting at March 11th. So as we go through that, we go through the change of the seasons together, which is when you do your spring cleaning, which isn't just cleaning up your house. It's also cleaning up your body. Right. Yes. And your, and your bowel. I still, I did do a clonic. Uh, yeah. Early on in my raw days, I didn't, I haven't kept it up as I heard it, but it is extraordinary what comes out after the it's first crazy. few It's crazy. I mean, yesterday was, I was like, what's going on? I can't believe this. You know, because I, it's not like I'm going out and eating like I'm like feasting or something, but 
we, it, it's bringing to light the real truth, which is we are all full of you know what, and um, <laughs> and it's got to come out. It's got to come out. It's just all waste. I always say, you know, the way we solve our political problems is we just put a colon hydrotherapist inside of the parliament building, or we put our colon hydrotherapist inside the capital of the United States. We're gonna clean that shit out quick. That's it's just that's a giant right. that's pipe right. coming out of Capitol oh, Hill, man. right? Oh, jeez. Um, it would it would really do us well, and uh, you know. So I put out a video the other day of like even some of these politicians drunk, and people are like, "Oh my god!" Because we, you know, I'm not you know like I'm not against alcohol, but when somebody's drunk all the time, it's kind of a thing. But people don't realize that a lot of these people running stuff, they're like on drugs, they're on alcohol, and when I say alcohol, they're not just enjoying a pint at the local pub; they're getting smashed. And it's like, whoa, do we really want to be taking orders from them? Um, you know, let's sober them up. And one of the most sobering and wonderful adventures is all the things we've been talking about. Right. But that's an important point because I, the other thing I suppose that it's important for me is I'd actually quit drinking, uh, one of the, before I had this, you know, this, this moment in Santa Monica with the raw food burger and so on. And I think I'm not sure I would have really, uh, tuned in to the difference that this was making for me had I still been drinking. I think it was because I'd stopped drinking that I was more sens sensitive to the benefits and I, and I could feel more, more of what was going on for me. So I, I do think that's an important point. It's like <laughs> quitting drinking, maybe, you know, maybe a very important step, even if you stop drinking for a while and, and then you experience some of this whilst not drinking, you're going to perhaps get more of a kick from it. I agree. I agree. I mean, that's one of the things, isn't it? It's like, if we're, if we're going on an adventure, sometimes the best um, adventure is a sober adventure because we haven't been sober in a long period of time. So suddenly we flip the, flip the script around and go, let's just go sober. You know, an addiction is really when, when we, uh, we don't sense the ability to stop, right? So no matter what it is that you're doing, sex, um, alcohol, cannabis, tobacco, at some point in your year, you got to go, I'm going to just stop that for a month or a day or a year or whatever you got. At some point, you have to go, I'm turning that off as part of the adventure of your life. And that's an important thing. So I, I learned that early on, like, hey, when you sense that you can't stop, there's a problem. So I've never been addicted to anything because I will stop and just go, well, I'm turning that off. And sometimes it stays off for years. And that's great. <laughs> Like, yeah. you know, I, I turned off beer drinking a long time ago, 27 years ago. That's not like I won't drink a beer, but it's like maybe one or two beers a year. Right. right. You know, I'm just because that's just not not my favorite thing. It's I'm not against it, but it's just not what I'm into. Yeah. No, no, I get it. Well, David, we've hit the top of the hour and I know you need to run to your to your massage. So thank you. Um once again, you know, for sharing, well, more than anything, just sharing your energy, right? And, and being a living embodiment of, uh, yeah, of the shift that's possible uh, if, if you change your diet. So, yeah, thank you so much. Right on. Thanks so much. And if anybody wants to track me down, you can always track me down at davidwolf.com, W-O-L-F-E. You can always track me there and yeah. find out what we're doing. And the, and the, and the cleanse uh, coming up, right? That's, that's going to be there, right? Yeah, it'll be there. And the best way to do that is if you hit my site, just get on my, my newsletter. And I'd send out a newsletter once a week. And it's a lot of fun. I put a lot of memes in it. It's mostly memes because that's really what people want. <laughs> and if it's anything like, if it's anything stuff, like your, your telegram, it'll be, it it'll be entertaining. Yeah, because everyone's like, we just want the memes. I'm like, okay, I'll get the memes <laughs> to you. So my newsletter is like, you know, I'll put 37 memes in there and maybe a few, you know, text paragraphs. Um, but it'll be in there. And March 11th, 2021, join us. And hopefully you'll join us, Richard. I hope, I hope to see you there. Oh, well, yes. No, I'll, I'll <laughs> toddlers demands uh, notwithstanding, I'll, I'll do my best. And the tree planting, if people want to donate to that, get involved with the tree planting, where should they go for that? It's ftpf.org, Fruit Tree Planting Foundation, ftpf.org. And again, we had a wonderful year. What a team. I'm so proud of them. And 96,000 trees planted last year. And that's where, you know, I put all, every time I have extra money, it always goes there. That's anything, anytime anybody, like you, we always charge people for the cleanse because that way they're committed. But a chunk of that money goes to the Fruit Tree Planting Foundation. And that's, you know, that's where all my extra money goes is to there. I, I never wanted a mansion and a yacht. I'm not that person, but I do want trees in the ground. That gives me some deep satisfaction. So that's where it goes. Great. Okay. Thanks once again. Enjoy your massage. Thank you. Okay. Cheers. Cheers.
Tschüss, bye-bye.